Good morning, this is Rick Gleason and Don King coming to you from the University of Washington Region 10 OSHA Training Center for our podcast called uh, Worker Safety and Health and the Heartbeat of Safety and Health. Uh, Don, we have two special guests today. Can you tell us a little bit about each of them? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Rick. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, I happen to be in Kentucky, so uh, welcome again, everybody. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Scott Geller, uh, who is a author of many books and many papers and has uh, been teaching um, at the university for 40-plus years. And has my fifth year. Fifth year. <laughs> okay, that's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations on that. And uh, has been a guest uh, for many, many, many uh, ASSP um, functions. Uh, so we welcome you, uh, Dr. Geller. And of course, the other guest is uh, Mr. Charlie Moorcraft, who is also an author and has been uh, what we call boots on the ground person who actually has lived through and done more than most would ever consider in a lifetime when it comes to safety and what you need to know and not to know and what you think you know uh, mr moorcraft probably has done it and said it all many times but we're we're thrilled to have him here uh, and again, uh, he's been out there now in the community for 30 plus years, maybe 35 now, Charlie, maybe 40. Yeah, at least, uh, at least 30. Um, yes. Yeah. And so, Seems like uh, 40. <laughs> I know. Well, listen, uh, again, we're delighted to have both of you back again. And so why don't the two of you uh, start the program and uh, tell us what you think is the best way to get people's head in the game? Well, for me, the Go best ahead, way to Charlie. get people's head in the game is uh, personal. Keep it personal. Um, forget all the statistics, forget all the numbers, forget all the money. I know we need that to run our safety programs. I know it's essential for upper management to have that. But for the guy in the field, he could care less about that. What he cares about is his family. And if you if you don't keep it personal, you're not going to get through to him. And that's... That's, that's the only way that I have found over the years uh, to get through to people. And I've spoke every place from Harvard to, uh, to uh, Africa. I'm heading for um, Liberia in a couple of days. And uh, I find that people are people, and what they care about is their families. It's a universal message. It's about going home at the end of the day, kissing your wife, hugging your kids. That's about it. Kissing your spouse, I should say. And so I, I kind of keep my my messages somewhat somewhat simple. I keep throwing it right, you know. And so that's that's the that's where I come from. Yeah, and I would add to that one word, one word, empathy, empathy. And and I, I hope we'll get to talk a little bit about the perspective I think we need to take. I'm calling it humanistic behaviorism. But let me back up. Empathy means that you really try to find out where the other person is coming from. So when Charlie says keep it personal, he's really meaning, I think, Charlie, right? Where is the other person coming from? And you, in your travels, you, you travel around in different cultures, different perspectives, and they're under, under different systems for safety. The idea is before you tell somebody what to do, before you tell, give somebody a directive, find out where they're coming from. Ask more questions. Where, what, do you, what do you feel about the process? What do you think we ought to do to, to improve safety in our organization? Boy, that's such a... Exactly. Yeah, I like that, Scott. Now, another question is, uh, and of course, some of these questions are going to seem a little odd, but when the management buys in with 
uh, smoke and mirrors, and you know there isn't a culture up at the top, uh, give us some ideas on how to take that on. Well, let's start by saying there is, there are too many smoke and mirrors. I mean, that one of my disappointment these days is is that this marketing of a of a narrow minded approach to the human side of safety and the banners at the conferences. I mean, again, marketing wins over profound knowledge, and so um, yeah, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. Now, me. Uh, where I come from is if you have an upper management who's not bought into a safety program and it filters right down the line, you might as well quit and start look for another job. Is it worth it to die on a job? Is, is, that, is that what your goal is? Not me, not me. Uh, I, I'll only work for a company that, that cares about the safety of their people. If, it's, if a company could care less, it's time to start looking for another company. I agree. Um, what are some of the things that you, both of you gentlemen, feel make an outstanding safety professional? Oh, wow. again, for me, I, what I think is an uh, outstanding safety professional is the person who considers people on the field, who is not, and is not afraid, of, afraid to upset people. Uh, you know, when you're when you're a safety guy, um, <laughs> if, you, if at the end of the day you you didn't piss somebody off, you didn't do your job. You got to be I willing agree. to take the flack, and you got to be yeah. willing to step up and tell people what you think. But you got to be honest about it. I'm always honest. When I walk into a company, I tell upper management that if they ask me a question, I'm I'm going to answer it, and you may not like the answer but I'm going to tell the truth about what I think. And uh, sometimes that doesn't sit, sit well uh, with upper management. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not a union anymore. I'm not management anymore. I'm, I'm just Charlie. So I can say these things. Uh, and, uh, and most of it, 99 times out of 100, matter of fact, 100 times out of 100, management is happy with that answer. They want, they want to know for sure what's going on, and uh, they're they're happy with that. I think I, yeah. I think I the word the word that I, that I hear Charlie that I hear when Charlie says that those excellent words is feedback. Feedback. We cannot learn without feedback. Practice does not make perfect. We have to learn how we're doing, and we have to be another word that I that I use to to label what Charlie just saying is transparency. We have to be truthful and open and transparent. And, and one more thing too, when the manager, when the, when the CEO of a company says he or she is putting safety first, that he or she really cares, actively cares for safety, that changes the whole perspective. Because let's face it, companies are all about profit. And when you, when you, Say, I care most about your safety. I care, as Charlie said, and you get home safely. That that tells the people that man, these folks, these folks care about me. That's the only message that reflects caring, because everything else is about profit. Everything else is get the job done. So again, when the manager or the leader or the CEO or the supervisor says, you know, folks, I really care, and you know what? Give me some feedback. Tell me how I can improve and, and allow me perhaps to tell you how you might improve, but let's be transparent and let's be empathic. I like it. Very good. Uh, Rick, you got a couple questions for him? So I, I was, I appreciate you, you explaining that because when, when we talked, we were thinking of titling this, you know, episode actively caring for people's safety and, and that word actively really denotes this feedback loop so that it's going both ways and that maybe we as safety professionals should be doing more listening than lecturing. Absolutely. And let me throw something in. I know Charlie's going to get me on the academics, 
but the academic word, the evidence-based word, the therapy word is humanistic behaviorism. Briefly, what do I mean? Well, caring is humanism. Empathy is humanism. Looking out for the other person is humanism. However, that's not enough. We have to act on our caring, and that is behaviorism. So from an academic perspective and the stuff that I've been writing about and it's the foundation of six training books I've, I've written at this point is, is humanistic behaviorism or actively caring. I, and, you know, I think, uh, I think Rick, we're going to rename this. I think we're just going to call it actively caring for people, leave off the safety. Because the yeah. safety is always around us, but it's really about caring for people. That's the message we got to get out there. That's exactly what the message is, is, is caring about, about people. And yeah. before you can ask the questions, you have to get people to trust you. Uh, before you can answer the questions, I should say. Yeah. You know, uh, going out and telling somebody, I care about you, you know what they say? Oh, they don't like <laughs> that. That's what they're told they're saying. You're, you're standing there saying, I care, I care, I care. And they're saying, bull, bull, bull. Show me. Show me what, how you care. Show me. Put your mouth, money where your mouth is. And I'm not just talking about, you know, financially, but just, uh, you know, show, show me how you care. Uh, let's do something. Let's get this, uh, this growing. It, it can't be uh, just present a program. We used to call it the program of the month at Exxon. Every month they'd have a new program. And right. as soon as the program came out, we'd all say, oh, another damn bull, you know, bull program. It's not going to not gonna get any place, you know. But if you have somebody who comes in and, and really, really cares about you and shows that they care about you uh, by asking about your family, asking about your loved ones, asking about your life, uh, then, you can, then you can finally ask them about the job. But you can't go right to the job. You've you got to show that you're care about the human side. You know, I, I always tell people, I tell them a story about when I worked at Exxon. Uh, right after Valdez, uh, everybody was um, really upset with Exxon. I mean, people were throwing eggs at us when we walked out of the facility. Uh, it, it, was, it was a horrible, and, and, and that morale on the place was, was a total disaster. And so one day, and this is why I'm still union, uh, the plant manager, although he he knew I kind of walked, the, uh, you know, I cared about the company and I cared about the guys. He called me in one day. He was a brand new plant manager. And he said, Charlie, is there anything I can do to improve morale in this place? And his name was John Race. And I said, yeah, John, uh, there is. Uh, you know the, uh, the lights you used to put up during the holidays that went from the top of the stacks down to the bottom? You know, it looked like, that, it looked like a tree, a Christmas tree. It doesn't have to be Christmas, but it could be anything, you know. Uh, and uh, he said, yeah, I said, well, they did away with that a, long, a number of years ago because of the energy crisis. And uh, the people like that. The, the guys like that. So he says, well, well, I can do that, you know. So that year he put up all the lights on the top of the, top of the stacks down to the bottom on five of, five of our stacks. And he said, what else? I said, well, every year, John, you guys send out that holiday card. And it's, uh, it's not even a car, it's a mimic, it's a, well, a Xerox sheet that says, you know, happy holidays, and, you know, it's, it's Xerox. I said, throw that damn thing away and send out a Christmas card. But he said, you know, I, I, I can go you one better than that, Charlie. He said, I, I'll send out a Christmas card and I'll personally sign it with my wife and we'll send it out to everybody. And so he did. Right after the holidays, he called me into the office. He says, Charlie, I could have given those guys a raise, and I wouldn't have gotten the reaction I got from them. They all called me up to tell me and thank me for the card and for the lights. And how much did that possibly cost? $2,000? But that made a difference. That made a difference. That gave us an opening to step into. So you got to show that you care, and then you can step into the opening. Hey, let me add to that, Charlie. Once again, man, you bring the real world to 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 us. Um, so Charlie talks about trust and talks about caring. Let me just throw in here that there's five levels of conversation, 
I mean, how do you build trust? How do you show people you care? Through conversation. So let's let's just let just let me briefly just define five levels at the, the bottom level, the foundation is relationship building conversations. And again, that's what Charlie said, you know, that, that Christmas card that really that really had the names personal name. They made it personal. Charlie and I have talked about that at keynotes at NSC. Make it personal. That was our our title of our talk. So that's the bottom. You have to, you can't develop trust until you develop a relationship. Now, after you have that relationship, by the way, that means when you see somebody and you say, how are you doing? That's just another hello. It's more yeah. like, how are the kids? Or, or did, did they gra- uh, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm at a university with, it's tough to do that when you have 600 students in your class or, or, a, st- or a supervisor who's, who's talking, who's working with 50 folks. But the point is, that's what makes the difference. You know, getting personal. Then, then after that, it's a possibility conversation. It's a possibility conversation. Before you tell people what to do, how about ask them, hey, what do you see happening? How can we make it better? What's the possibility around here? Could we develop an actively caring for people culture? What would that mean for you? So that's the conversation where you're not telling people what to do, but you're asking them what they would like to see happen. What is, are the possibilities? Then, after they tell you, they give you their vision. What would they like to see? And, and that's, that's pie in the sky, perhaps, but that's their vision. Now you get back to behavior, action. Given that your vision, what can we do today? What goals should we set? Behavior-based goals today. Next conversation is opportunity. Given the action, now let's discuss the opportunities when we can put this action in place. And finally, number five, follow-up. The follow-up conversation where you say, how, how did that happen? How are you doing? But again, back to, back to Charlie's point, it starts with a foundation of relationship building. And again, that's when, they, that's when they really believe you care. That's when they trust that when you say, I care, they trust that you mean what you say. You know, I used to, uh, Scott, you probably heard me talk about this before. When I was a safety guy at, at Exxon, one of the safety guys at Exxon, every now and then a hot job would come down from on high. You know, it, it, a hot job is when either we get this job done or we're going to have to shut down the refinery. And when you shut down the refinery, one, it cost a million dollars a day. Back then it did. I don't know what it costs now. Uh, two, it's as dangerous as hell when you bring down a refinery or you start it up. So there'd be a hot job that had to get done unless, uh, or the refinery was going to shut down. So management up on high would send down to the first line supervisor, get this job done. He'd go out to the guy in the field and say, hey, get this job done and get it done now. Guy go out there, take a look at the job. I'm not doing that job. I think that's unsafe. You know, the, the first line supervisor who is under the gun, do the job. I'm not doing a job. Do the job. I'm not doing a job. Now you'd have a big, you have a big commotion, and you'd wind up with well, labor getting involved. And in my case, it was the union getting involved, and upper management would get involved, and they were all arguing back and forth there about this job. And of course, in the meantime, the job is sitting there. They used to say to my guys, instead of saying, I'm not doing that job, how about saying, I can't do the job that way. However, I can do it this way. You guys have been here for 20 years, 15, 10. You know how to do the job. You know how to do it safely. Do the job. Let's get it done. Let's get paid. And let's all go home. It's simple. Just work together. Figure it out. You know, you've been there forever. For the most part, companies today have long-term employees. And just figure out how to do it. You know how to do it. You're the expert. You've been on this job forever. Let's get it done. Wow, you that... see Charlie's talking about empathy again. Mm-hmm. You know, the supervisor who comes in and says, we got a problem, here's how we're going to fix it. That's top-down. That's yeah. not empathy. Empathy right. is... Here's a problem. You're the experts. Come back to me tomorrow with, with a possibility for a solution. Respect their competence.
competence. When you gotcha. give people the perception of competence, the perception of working together, collaboration, and the perception that's called relatedness, and we're in this together, and the perception of choice. You choose to do this. You know what you do? You increase self-motivation. You increase self-accountability. And if you ask me, that's the challenge of every safety professional out there. How do you develop self-motivation among your employees? And by the way, there's a lot of research, evidence-based research, that will show you how to do that. And what Charlie just said is really the foundation of that, is building trust, relationship conversations, and showing people you care. Got it. Boy, this is such good stuff. So, Dr. Geller, is there a way if folks had uh, questions, our listeners, you might have a website or something they could go to? And then, Charlie, same same question to you, because uh, we barely scratched the surface. But uh, what's a good contact, the best way folks could uh, check in with you? Mine is, you know, I want to, mm-hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I want to say that. Well, I, I just want to say that check out my TEDx talk. It's 15 minutes on self-motivation. And it talks about how you build self-motivation, what it means to feel empowered, and that connects directly to actively caring. All you have to Google is Scott Geller TEDx. And I'm, I'm proud to say I've got 7.8 million views at this point. So a lot of people are, are looking at this particular perspective. Now, by the way, the answers aren't there. The principles are there. Now you show that to a work group and you say, look, here's what the professor says, 15 minutes. Now let's talk about how we put those principles in place in our culture. How can we customize choice, competence, and community, the key to self-motivation? How do we put that in, uh, in place in our workplace? And, and one more thing, we do have a website, um, Actively Caring for People, AC4P. And there are resources there, and there's books available, and and um, and we even have a theme song now, Here to Share and Care, an original theme song produced by James O'Connor and in, in Nashville two years ago. And you can check it out at, at ac4p.org. No, 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 I, I, I help with the lyrics, but yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so um, good. Charlie, how? Me, uh, yeah. My, it's. CharlieMoorcrift.com. Got it. And I'll be more than happy to answer a- any questions that, that I can. I, uh, you know, getting back to one other thing about, uh, you know, OSHA is a tremendous organization. I, I, I've worked, I work closely with OSHA. They, they use my videos all over the world, uh, all over the country. They're not all over the world. But so I, I've, I, have, I, have, I work with OSHA closely, so I'm not knocking OSHA. But every now and then, OSHA would come out with a, uh, regula- a new regulation that didn't quite pertain to our facility, to a refinery. However, it's a regulation. And my guys would be going nuts over this new regulation. So what I used to do is I used to go out and I'd say, listen, guys, I know this new regulation is, is almost impossible to follow. It, it seems ridiculous for us. However, it's a law, and we got to do it. So I need your help here. Help me figure out a way to accomplish this and still get the job done and meet the requirements. So just give me, give me some ideas. Give me some, give me some feedback here. And it's a different approach, and they, they would do it. They would do it, and then they'd follow the regulation because they came up with a solution. So that's. One of the ways I, I used to try and do things, and still, still do. You know, I try to get, uh, as I guess as Scott says, get their feedback, get get them bought into the program. If if they're bought into the program, it's very difficult to uh, to refuse to follow a program if you help develop it. <laughs> That's such a good and, and point. You respect, mm-hmm. you respect their competence. You respect yeah. their expertise. You know, yeah. people are self-motivated when they believe they're competent at doing worthwhile tasks and worthwhile work. We've all been there. When we believe we're competent at doing something worthwhile, we're going to do it 
independent of the monetary consequences. Actually, we're going to do it because we feel good about it. How do you help people feel competent? Charlie just told us, man, you know, ask them for the solution. You know, ask them how they would do it. And again, back to the OSHA, it, it is too bad that there's, there's lack of empathy, isn't that? This is the way it's top down. Top down doesn't work, but Charlie's solution, this is our rule. How can we make it work in our organization? How can we customize this to make it work? By the way, in behavior-based safety, they're talking about you give a checklist. Well, who develops a checklist? It doesn't come from OSHA. It doesn't even come from the safety professionals. The workers themselves come up with a checklist of what's safe and what's not safe on our job. And we observe each other and we give each other feedback about that checklist. And by the way, when the job changes, the checklist has to change. So that's what's not happening out there in the workplace. They think they've got one checklist for the whole workplace. No, yeah, it's, a, it's a different checklist of behaviors for our job. Give the people the, the, the respect and the competence they deserve. They develop the checklist, and they change the checklist as the job changes. Got it. Well, hey, this is... That, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. No. There's one thing that Scott and I um, uh, somehow disagree on, or not somehow. I, I know why we disagree on it. Um, I hate the word behavior-based, and I, I have a reason for that. When I was in Exxon, they came in, uh, one of the programs, you know, one of the Flavor of the Month program, was their behavioral-based safety. And they presented this to our union. We were Teamsters. And they presented it to the Teamsters as a behavioral-based program. That went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> Just the word behavioral-based. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because it, right off the bat, it meant that their behavior was somehow flawed or that they needed somebody to change their behavior, and it, I'm serious, it went over like a lead balloon. Mm -hmm. So I, I hate that term, <laughs> you know, behavioral based. <laughs> I understand hey, what it Charlie means. Scott, and I understand what Scott means, but, mm -hmm. but, but Charlie, guys, some people, yeah. some people okay. hate the word feedback for the same reason. Yeah, we hate the word feedback. I come to my office at the end of the week, at the end of the day, I would like to give you some feedback. Oh my God, it's been ruined. <laughs> So it's, a, it's how we use the words, man. And let's yeah. face it, you need to start with behavior, but you need to be humanistic about it. And again, the way that was presented, the way that was presented at Exxon, obviously was a top-down, this is the way it is, change your behavior or else. Um, yeah. We're going to collect these numbers and put these on a computer and come back with data. That's not, what, that's not the way I designed it in 1979, man. 1979, first time. We use the word. That's not how it was about. It was actively caring for people. It was interdependent coaching with a checklist that the workers develop themselves so they can really document what's right and what's wrong on our job. It's true engagement for safety. But again, how it's presented, and it's presented sometimes in a very narrow perspective, and I'll get back to that word, humanistic behaviorism. Yeah. Yeah. They're one of the uh, one of the things I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Charlie. I I was oh, gonna say go there I'll I'll give you an example of mistakes that management makes and uh let's take uh, uh I know Scott hates the word accident, but let's take uh incident invest I'll call it, how about if I call it incident investigation, Scott. Does that work for you? Why would you call it injury investigation? All right. Why don't we well, they, it is, man? Oh, they may not be injured. That's why. I, I agree with you, Scott. I, 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 close I call. It's a close call. Yeah. Yeah. yeah close call. Yeah. Right. So anyway, you have you have something something occur, and management now is going to investigate this this incident. So they send uh, they call down for the individual that was involved. Now this guy has to go up to the BOB, in our, in our instance, that was the main office building. He has to go up to the main office building, which he never goes to. He goes into a room by himself, and some guy, or a couple of guys, usually it's a couple of guys, come in with clipboards and pencils and paper, and they ask him questions, and they write down everything he says, because they're investigating the, the incident. And he's sitting there, and, they, and they, of course they say to him, this is not a witch hunt, this is 
not a witch hunt. This is not a witch hunt. And he's sitting here, and here comes a bleep. He's sitting there saying, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Because that's what it looks like to him, you know? So I used to say to management, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. I said, listen, instead of you calling him up to your office, how about if you take your, take your clipboard, or you don't even take the clipboard, go down to where he is, go down to his shanty, and, and say to him, hey, Jim, what happened? That's a, that's a hell of a lot better than firing questions at him and writing down every single word that he writes, says, and, and, and saying to him, it's not a witch hunt, it's not a witch hunt. Of course it's a witch hunt. <laughs> so well, just be honest with these people. We need more honesty. We got away from that a long time ago. Charlie, what the word investigation is in such a negative. It's an investigation. Yeah, yeah, that yeah exactly. And then, then, then we're going to do an investigation to find the root cause. Oh, that's, yeah. that is <laughs> terrible. No, we, because in fact, we don't find cause and effect. You, you heard me say this so many times. Yeah. We, don't, we can't find cause and effect by asking questions. What we can find are contributing factors. So yeah. let's open up a conversation and let's, let's, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? How can we do better? That's back to transparency, back to honesty, back to feedback. But it's got, it, it, but it is, it's, and you start with empathy. You start with caring, don't you? You start with assuring them this is not an investigation. We're not trying to write up with our, on our clipboards whose fault this is, but that's how we yeah. come across. And that's the yep. language. We still use that language. Root that, cause. That, ask why. How many times? Everybody, five times. He asked five, why five times to get at the root cause. That is laughable. <laughs> but that's what's wrong with safety. And that's well, what's wrong with That's why you have a, a wall between management and labor. You know? Right. Yeah. And actually, safety needs an overhaul. And uh, I'm going to depend on you two to help us move that overhaul along with Krista uh, into maybe coming up with different terminologies, different ways of thinking. But my final question to the two of you for our next podcast is why are we still having people die falling from heights when all we talk about is tying off and so on and so forth? And Scott, I don't need the answer now. It's, it's a lot bigger and, and worse than we think. But the question is, what can we as professionals put together to really attack this problem of people falling from heights and dying. So I think there's a lot to be done in that arena. And like I said, Scott, it's, it's, it's not something we can do now and we're not going to, but I do think it's worth all of us getting together and making a platform just about that. Yeah. That is so I great. That at my facility. I had one fatality and it was somebody who fell off the top of my cat plant because he didn't have his harness on. Well, that's a great subject for our next podcast, and Don, I appreciate you bringing that up, and I so much appreciate having uh, Charlie Moorcraft and Scott Geller here with us today at our uh, podcast from the University of Washington Region 10 OSHA Training Center. Just let me get my toolbox and I'll take myself a book. I climbed up on the dozer with my mechanic's pride. Said, you can keep it running, friend, while I poke around inside. Shake hands with danger, meet a guy you ought to know. I used to laugh at safety, now they call me Three Finger Joe. I learned a lesson, I forgot it soon enough. The nicks and burns and scratches showed the young ones I was tough. Till another morning, I was grinding on some steel. My other hand got careless and fed my skin into the wheel. Shake hands with danger, step right up and say hello. Grinding wheels and metal I what made me Three Finger Joe. burning and I've seen them take a fall just to save themselves a minute and I've seen them lose it all 
I've watched them court in trouble, seen them take a chance and lose. They get careless for a moment, spend a lifetime with the blues. Shake hands with danger. Shake hands with danger. Shake hands with danger. Compared to them, I'm lucky to be just Three Finger Joe. 